Glacier National Park, Montana. Big changes are here. Wow, this is crazy. Some marvels fight to endure. As fresh wonders are revealed. What new wilderness will emerge? That's a massive feature up there. Glacier National Park. Six dramatic peaks over 10,000 feet, all carved by glaciers. Lakes that hold icebergs year round. countless waterfalls fed by melting snow and ice. To see it, act fast. The earth is warming at an alarming pace. The great ice masses that shape and support this ecosystem will soon be gone. Many things will never be the same. Plants, fish, mammals. Two big questions. How quickly will it change? And what defiant new wilderness will remain? find out teams of scientists. This is a brand new thing going on here. Explorers. You think I should go a little higher? And adventurers. There's a lot of unknown. They fight to keep up with the speed of change. To predict what will happen next, in an environment already extreme. We've had one record of 166 miles an hour before the instrumentation blew away. We've recorded 100 mile an hour winds for 13 hours straight. Dan Fagri is a scientist for the U.S. Geological Survey and this area's lead expert on glaciers the right man to lead a key investigation. The subject, once the park's largest glacier. Its name, Blackfoot. Two years ago, it looked something like this. Then, Thousands of tons of ice collapsed at once. Some 25 acres gone. Perhaps a defining moment for this wilderness. Only Dan can say for sure. He's been desperate for an up-close look at the collapse. Let me get that one out. We need to get in and see what's happening in this glacier. 
It's just now coming out from under the snow. We want to do some mapping and uh, look at this because it's a pretty dramatic feature. Yep. Okay. You all set? Yep. It's a three day expedition, much of it off the beaten track. What they find will help Dan estimate how long before all the park's glaciers are gone for good. The rate at which we've seen glaciers melting here is already quite dramatic, but uh, when they're occurring in these large events like this, it means that the pace has quickened. The success of this mission is still uncertain. Weather has stopped them before. Rain, lightning, fog, snow, all a gamble. Most of the year, Glacier looks like this. The true nature of this wilderness hides beneath a blanket of white, up to 20 feet deep. Then everything changes. Summer opens a window, and for a brief time, explorers try their luck. For tourists, the going to the sun road opens clear through. the only road that cuts through the heart of this million-acre wilderness. This road is how some two million visitors a year taste Glacier's splendor. As they travel 50 miles from one side of the park to the other. But beyond the blacktop, safe passage in this region is less certain. Where Montana borders Canada is a mountainous area ecologists call the crown of the continent. Right in the middle, Glacier National Park. It joins Canada's Waterton Lakes National Park to make the jewel in this crown. The continental divide splits it all into two unpredictable weather systems. The mountainous western half is wetter, getting its weather from the Pacific Ocean. The eastern half is drier and adjoins the vast plains of the Midwest. Eighteen of the park's 26 remaining glaciers cluster along this divide. In the drier months, both sides depend on water from melting glaciers. But for how much longer? Well, the stream we're next to right now is basically meltwater from the snow fields and the glaciers. A lot of these systems that depend on this water are going to dry up and you'll have big changes in vegetation. At more than 50 sites throughout the park, scientists monitor the habitat, biology, and chemistry of streams and waterways like this, with some startling results. It's a circulatory system, and National Park's ecologist, Billy Schweiger, is the man with his finger on the pulse. It's essentially a collection of vital signs um, of the, the health, the 
the ecological integrity of uh, the streams. The algae on this rock are called didymo. Common name, rock snot. It's natural for some of it to be here. But last week, Billy encountered Didymo unlike anything he had ever seen. Look at this. You know, we stumbled upon this the other day and, and it's just like, wow. This is crazy, you know, why is this happening? A thick carpet of rock snot covers an area some 100 yards square. Possibly the park's largest bloom ever. So the texture is very much like wet cotton. It feels like walking on shag carpet. For an aquatic insect trying to live in this, they want it to look like that, right? But it looks like this. This is a completely qualitative change in what this stream is like. Didymo is beginning to bloom in large mats elsewhere as well, likely driven by warming water. These kinds of blooms of Didymo did not occur five or 10 years ago. With water temperatures increasing, with the summers getting longer, there's a good chance that this will continue to increase. We definitely have to watch this really carefully. Didymo choking the waterways may imperil fish. Fish already threatened by disturbed habitat, changes in temperature patterns, and invasive species. Yet there is hope that nature's resilience will win over. All right, all aboard. Let's go catch some bull trout. Clint Mulfield is on a three-day expedition to the park's remote north. What he finds may give new hope to populations threatened by climate change. Well, what's so exciting is that this population might have a better chance of persisting over time in the face of a warming climate. This team of USGS fisheries researchers paddles across Lower Kintla Lake. Below them, the type of biological change common throughout Glacier National Park. These native bull trout are threatened by invasive species. We've seen tremendous declines in bull trout populations to the point that many of these populations are literally on the brink of extinction. But traversing Lower Kintla Lake is just the beginning of their quest. They've had a report of odd goings on in the next lake up. Home to some of the strangest fish in the park. Clint and his USGS crew hike upstream, deeper into the backcountry, to Upper Kintla Lake. Their mission, to find out how the fish in Upper Kintla survive and thrive. Upper and Lower are two lakes separated by large waterfalls. Barriers that stop invasive fish from swimming upstream. The Upper Kentla population has not been perturbed at all. It's remained like it is today over 10 to 14,000 years. In isolation, Upper Kentla's fish seem to have adopted the strangest habits.
for one, they are cannibals. Big bull trout eat small bull trout. It's obviously working for the population. They've done it for thousands of years, so this is something that's been sorted out over, you know, geologic time. Clint also sees last year's gravel piles, fish nests called reds, only not where he expected them. Fish usually go upstream to spawn, but not the bull trout in this lake. They capture young. Juvenile bull trout. Excellent, good job. And confirm that these fish use the lake outlet for spawning and rearing. Nice. No one knows for sure why these fish swim downstream to spawn. But it's an adaptation that may serve them well when melting glaciers stop feeding the inlets. Under a warming climate, we expect the inlet streams to warm up. And they might not be suitable uh, when the bull trout need to spawn. The outlet stream, it's always going to be supplied with water. And that creates some really good habitat. There's hope that that bull trout population in Upper Kintla Lake will persist. As the glaciers disappear and temperatures rise, many waterways in the park will get warmer. Most fish will feel it. And at least one human. While most adventurers in Glacier National Park tackle peaks and ridges, Mark Enkenbauer combs the backcountry for lakes. I've stared at the map and I've just learned this million acres so much that I've kind of started looking at it more in terms of, of a series of drainages. You know, a lot of people think of it as a park of peaks. I, I see it as a park of lakes. Mark is six years into an eight-year quest to jump into all the named lakes in the Waterton Glacier Wilderness, some 168. Definitely not a bad view. I've done 116 lakes up till now. Often, these lakes sit off the beaten track. Average maximum temperature, rarely above 50 degrees. Some hold icebergs. This project made me very attached to the park. It's kind of started off as being just a personal endeavor. It's definitely evolved in, into almost kind of a celebration of life for me. Now, a frigid moment of truth. Mark has turned his endeavor into a charity event, raising money and awareness for children with cancer. It's like all the rest of them, chilly. But wonderful. Mark has 50 or so lakes left. He'll be done in a few years. 
The question everyone wants to know, could temperatures change that quickly? How long before glaciers stop feeding these lakes? By recent estimates, the year 2030. But Dan Fagri may revise that once he gets a good look at the Blackfoot Glacier. And we're gonna go to a ridge, cross the way, and see if we can get to the area where the glacier collapsed. So this is gonna be our first up close look at it. So this is gonna be something we're eager to see. It's day two of Dan Fagri's expedition. And already, the signs reveal a startling fact. Glacier National Park and areas like it are warming much faster than the rest of the planet. One thing that's pretty typical of mountains like this is that they're warming at two to three times the global rate. So that has profound implications for the types of change that we're gonna see in mountain ecosystems. The likely reasons, more humidity, fewer clear nights, and less snow cover on the mountaintops. To get more evidence, Dan also looks right beside the path. Important clues hide in the trees. Trees are a wonderful uh, accomplice for us, so to speak, in deciphering the mystery of climate changes. Many of these trees are 400 years old. Some in the park are 900. A core sample from this tree can reveal a long history of fire, avalanche, insect outbreaks, drought, and wet periods. And if we do this for a whole host of trees, get, say, several hundred of these kind of cores, we can tell what the whole forest has been experiencing. We can reconstruct drought periods from 400 years ago. So this is a window into the past. What's immediately obvious, the trees are on the move. For centuries, persistent snow has kept conifers back from the flower-filled meadows. With warmer weather and less persistent snow, the meadows are under siege. Well, what's gonna happen is that these trees will continue to be successful in invading these open areas. So eventually, you'll see a kind of a sloping invasion that eventually, from both sides, meets in the middle, and then you've cut off that meadow. So this is clearly a result of a changing climate. These things could not have done this for hundreds of years prior to this. Smaller meadows will mean less food. Many plants here are edible berries and roots. Glacier lily, prime bear food. If this continues, you'll have some consequences for valued wildlife species like, like grizzly bears. Are bears threatened by these changes? It's Kate Kendall's job to find out and she's found a revolutionary way of doing it. Let's look at sample. I think it might be grizzly. Kate takes hair samples from trees that grizzlies and black bears like to rub on. This is really a great rub tree. It's had a lot of use from bears. It's got a lot of bite marks on it and claw marks. A few pieces of barbed wire ensure she gets all the DNA she needs. From just a few hairs that have roots on them, we can get information about the species, sex, and individual identity of the bears. 
No one knows why different bears like to rub against the same tree. But remote cameras may provide some clues. They've captured remarkable footage of bears rubbing. Footage beyond Kate's imagination. The first footage that we got was just uh, unbelievably amusing. We just couldn't believe our lucky stars that we had captured this behavior on film. Every time we go check a camera and bring the film back, it's like, you know, Christmas and Easter and, and everything combined. Perhaps the bears are scent marking. Perhaps it just feels good. Either way, the small pieces of wire placed on the trees capture hair. The DNA from that hair tells us how much bears rely on Glacier. The National Park was only a small portion of the wilderness studied, but it holds nearly half of the grizzly bears. Forty-six percent of the individual bears that we identified were just in Glacier National Park, which was 13 percent of the study area. So a very dense population in Glacier. Around 240 grizzlies live in the park area. They depend on plants, like those found in meadows, for about 80% of their diet. If those meadows shrink, so may the park's bear population. But Kate remains optimistic. Because grizzly bears are omnivores, they're better able to adapt to climate change. I think their prospects are, are pretty good here. Not all of the park's mammals may be as lucky. It seems one of this area's most remarkable creatures depends on snow beyond anyone's expectations. The wolverine. Wolverines resemble miniature bears. Technically, they are weasels but with incredible strength. The park supports the highest density of wolverines ever reported in the contiguous U.S. Only about 40 animals. Biologist Jeff Copeland travels high in Glacier National Park. This is it, this is where they like to live. Jeff investigates wolverine habitat. He does it to find out how much wolverines rely on this landscape. So far, the results are astonishing. There's only been a handful of wolverine studies done um, in the world, let alone in North America. We're just beginning to develop a, you know, a real strong understanding of this animal's role in the ecosystem. The Rocky Mountain Research Station supported a four-year project. Jeff and his team tracked wolverines to their dens in the dead of winter, when only the bravest entered the park. Here's a little baby. The used GPS collars, as well as surgically inserted radio transmitters. This work began to reveal a remarkable life history. They found the young stay with mom for eight to nine months. 
Then they may spend a year with the father. From him, they likely learn how and where to find food. Adult wolverines can cover vast distances over the harshest of terrain, even in the dead of winter. But like any superhero animal, wolverines have a weakness. And it's a big one. A wolverine at 35 below zero can just pretty much kick back and relax. I mean, they can handle it. But what about the upper end? There's got to be some point where it's just too hot. Wolverines will only make dens in snow that lasts until the second week of May. Global warming is reducing the number of places for them to den. Usually, climate change is a very gradual, long-term thing, and animals can often adjust unless there's some specific characteristic of the climate that they are directly tied to. And we think that may be the case with the wolverine in its dependence on snow. Unless glaciers wolverines are able to adapt to a changing climate, populations here may disappear. Other animals face a similar predicament. One may be more vulnerable to global warming than any other mammal in the lower 48. It's called a pika, an elusive species with extraordinary qualities. Lucas Moyer Horner searches for pikas in high altitude rocky outcrops. He studies their behavior and tries to get a count. They only can live in talus fields, boulder piles, and those are only found in mountain ranges. Even if he can't see them, he can count their food caches and note their distinct sound. That's a pika. Okay, here's a pika hay pile. Few visitors get to see a pika, but just when you least expect it. Here's a pika right now. A rare encounter with one of the most uniquely adapted mammals on the planet. And this one isn't shy. <laughs> Never had him do that before. It most likely wants the salt from the sweat on Lucas's clothes. Oh, he actually got through my pants. Congratulations. You chewed a hole through my pants. Pikas are used to getting nutrition from unusual places. They are so adapted to the cold, they don't hibernate, but stay under these rocks beneath up to 20 feet of snow for eight to nine months of the year. To survive, they'll even eat their own feces. There's some nutritional value to it, and they'll actually collect the feces of other species too and eat that. Like this is some marmot scat right here. The problem comes when it gets too warm. If they're outside an ambient temperature of about 80 degrees Fahrenheit, they'll die after about half an hour of exposure. I think they're emblematic of the type of animal that is gonna have trouble dealing with climate change. And I think we can learn a lot from how they respond. Southern populations will almost certainly disappear as it gets warmer. The only question, how long before that happens here? 
there are a lot of changes here. Glacier Park's gonna look a lot different without snow and ice. Dan reaches a major milestone on his hike to Blackfoot Glacier. He gets his first good look since part of it collapsed two years ago. Even at a distance, he's shocked. Blackfoot was once the largest glacier in Glacier National Park. Now, from afar, Dan Fagri sees it breaking up. The whole glacier is really coming apart. And now it looks like there's 80, 100 feet of ice is melted. This is quite a bit different than we last saw it. For a more detailed assessment of glacier melt, scientists dig into the archives. A good view of a glacier is precious to an expert like Dan. Yep, okay, we're getting closer. If he can get in the exact right spot. Okay, this is looking good. Sexton Glacier is one where the melting isn't so obvious. Dan aligns his camera to match a photo taken in 1930. Well, there we can see the glacier as it was. There was an open meadow. There's a guy on a horse there. There's a photographer there. Well, I think this is probably the exact perspective. Subtle differences tell him this glacier is thinning. Elsewhere, Old photographs, side by side with new shots, show extreme changes. It's a park-wide meltdown. Even glaciers that showed little melting for decades now rapidly retreat. And that's not the only change Dan sees. Notice the species of conifer. This entire scene has changed because there's no longer white bark pine here. They've been killed. You're not only seeing changes in glaciers, but you're seeing changes in the trees in the same photograph. Those missing trees, white bark pine, can still be found in the park. And those who search for them hold great hope for the tree's future. That's 0.18 miles, so off in this direction. Rebecca Lawrence and her group scour the backcountry for survivors of blister rust, a disease caused by a fungus that strangles white bark pine. They start to die from the top down. This is pretty typical. The white bark population in Glacier used to be a fifth of the forest, and there are huge stands uh, throughout the park that are just decimated and just skeletons, essentially. The fungus was accidentally brought to North America from Europe around 1910. How it may spread with global warming, no one knows for certain. This pine's seeds are high in fat, they're a key food source for many species. So every pine lost hurts. The good news, every now and then, specialists find a white bark pine that seems to be resistant. I'm so excited. Good. Tight on the rope. Climb away. I think I should go a little higher. Stacy Jacobson Burgard climbs 30 feet in search of just the right cones. The pollen cones look really healthy. They look beautiful. 
there's a chance that the seeds may also grow into trees resistant to rust. So these are the female cones for next year. They take two years to develop. In the meantime, they can be eaten by squirrels and birds. Well, this is a cone that's been um, predated by probably a squirrel. So we're trying to prevent the squirrels from eating the cones right now so that we can collect the seeds and to help maintain the population. Okay, are you ready with my cages? So the team uses mesh cages to protect the cones. Okay. I'm going to just make check the bottom again. Make sure that I don't have any openings there for critters. It looks good, they're tight. I'm, I'm happy with them. In a few months, the team will return to collect healthy seeds. They'll grow them in a forest service nursery and replant the young trees in the wild. Already, more than 6,000 have been planted. Our last white bark pine planting had 72% survival. It makes me feel like maybe we can help the species stay without slipping over the edge of, of extinction. Glacier Park managers fight to protect plants and animals threatened by warming. But nothing in our power will stop the glaciers themselves from disappearing. It does look steeper than we thought, doesn't it? Dan Fagri and his group hike their last mile to Blackfoot Glacier and the section that collapsed. When we get across that one section, we don't know how big the streams are and how dangerous it'll be to cross. What they find will help estimate how long it will be before all the glaciers are gone for good. At last, over the last ridge to Blackfoot, Dan Fagri braces himself for the worst. Dramatic signs of how quickly Glacier National Park will lose its glaciers. What they find first is a paradise, revealed by the receding glacier. The extent of which they've never seen firsthand. It's pretty impressive. Blackfoot Glacier has carved the rocks here into shelves and steeps. They now channel pristine water into aqua green lakes. And spectacular cascades. The glaciers are retreating and revealing all this sculpted landscape and it's really kind of like a large playground. It's kind of an amphitheater of a thousand waterfalls. Just on the edges, there's a little bit of fringe of vegetation. The ice used to reach more than 100 feet above Dan's head. 
Now, he walks on bare rock. As the glacier retreats, it leaves a signature. And you can see all the striations where rock that was embedded at the bottom of the glacier has scraped across this. That's a very telltale sign that this area has been heavily worked by an active glacier. Large chunks of ice break off without warning. We would try to get up on high ground. We have to move very quickly. Dan cautiously makes it to the leading edge of Blackfoot. For the first time, he can see up close what is seasonal snow versus what is permitted ice. Well, this is pretty massive. I mean, we have a, a face here that's 30, 40 feet high, and this is what broke off from the rest of the glacier and went cascading down behind us here. Once you see some disintegration occurring like this, the models that rely on gradual melting are basically not so good anymore. These glaciers are definitely melting three to four times faster than they used to. As the glacier thins and moves over some of the humpy topography, it just shatters, it just disintegrates. And so it's hard to believe that a glacier can go away this quickly, but when you have a situation like this, these glaciers could be gone in a decade or so. Everyone thought the glaciers would be here for at least 20 more years. Now it seems about 10. Blackfoot itself, once the park's largest glacier, now has areas so thin, they'll likely go even faster. The landscape it carved will remain, but without the ice melt in late summer, most of these waterfalls will cease to flow. This brand new valley of roaring cascades will become a mere whisper. It'll definitely be sad to see the glaciers go. But when you see this sculpted landscape, it's really a very kind of aesthetic area to be in. This is gonna be an interesting part of the park for a long time, even after the glaciers are gone. This wilderness is undergoing dramatic changes that we are only beginning to understand. Plants and animals have little time left to adapt to a warmer park. Bears will likely fare better than most. Others will fight to adapt. The more sensitive may be lost from the park altogether. What will remain is a dramatic new landscape. Glacier National Park will keep its name. Even when the ice is gone, the impact of the glaciers will live on. They are like giant sculptors, leaving us with a great work of art to admire for eternity. Thank you.